Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Coming up on Market to Market, when is a recession a recession? The chair of the Chicago Fed speaks. Drought crushes crops both foreign and domestic. A fight over water rights in the High Plains. Or if we don't get some fresh news, prices may be... And market analysis with Naomi Bloom, next. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Sukup Manufacturing Company, providing equipment and buildings to store and condition grain to help farmers adjust to market swings. We build drying, moving, and storage equipment designed to preserve the quality of their crops. Sukup Manufacturing, store now, profit later. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, August 12 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. Several markers used to determine the state of the economy are pointing towards a cooling of inflation. The producer price index for July was down half a percent, mostly on a drop in energy prices. The annualized rate went up 9.8 percent, but it was lower by one and a half percentage points when compared to June. Core PPI, which strips out food and fuel, rose two-tenths of a percent. But this also is a lower rate than last month. The annual rate is up 5.8 percent, and it too was advancing at a slower rate than in June. That same cooling of inflation was seen on the consumer side of the equation. The data is under increased scrutiny by federal officials everywhere from Pennsylvania Avenue to the 12 Federal Reserve Banks located across the country. John Torpy has our report. Economy. Actually, I just want to say a number. Zero. Today, we received news that our economy had zero percent inflation in the month of July. Zero percent. Here's what that means. While the price of some things go up went up last month, the price of other things went down by the same amount. The result, zero inflation last month. This week, President Biden shared economic news filled with optimism in the ongoing nationwide fight against high inflation. The Bureau of Labor Statistics released what some analysts have called surprising data for last month's consumer price index, where the CPI remained unchanged for the month of July. With an annual inflation rate now at 8.5 percent, Biden was upbeat about the nation's economy. When you couple that with last week's booming jobs report of 528,000 jobs created last month and 3.5 percent unemployment, it underscores the kind of economy we've been building. One economist watching inflation rates closely is Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago President Charles Evans. Evans was in Des Moines, Iowa, sharing his insights on recent economic findings. So it's natural to ask the question when you see growth stall or be negative, or is this the beginning of a recession? And I think the answer to that is no. Um, we are tightening monetary policy at the moment. And, um, you know, we're at about two and a half percent on the short term policy rate. That's a neutral level. And that's because we've got very high inflation. Evans noted statistics in the latest CPI report helped support his cautious optimism for what the economy might have in store for the remainder of 2022. It is an unusual economy and inflation is high for unusual reasons. Supply chains have been difficult. They've caused uh, uh, higher prices. Relative prices have gone up and labor force has been slow to come back. But saying that, businesses are hiring. Uh, vacancies are continuing to be up and people who are looking for a job can find them, even in the environment with rising rates. And so I'm optimistic the economy will continue to grow, grow well in the second half so that we'll definitely have positive growth this year and that we'll continue that in the next year while inflation is coming down. For Market to Market, 
I'm John Torpy. Precipitation varied across the U.S. this week, bringing some relief. But for those who miss the rain, their conditions worsen. The domestic drought is only part of the global weather snapshot, as Josh Bittner reports. As years-long arid conditions grip the western U.S., producers in Europe are enduring their continent's worst drought in decades. We're really worried, especially for eight months' time when the sheep are in for lambing. If we're feeding our winter rations now, we run the risk of running out. And across the country, people will be doing the same. So in the spring, it's going to push the demand up and it'll push the price up. England has been thumped by months of low rainfall and a record heat wave. France has declared their worst drought on record as crops from soybeans to lavender have suffered. Irrigation bans, drinking water shortages, and temporary power cuts to river-cooled nuclear power plants have followed. 90% of the Bosnian corn crop has been damaged, reportedly, due to severe drought in the Balkans, exacerbating cattle feed concerns. Tinder dry vegetation has given way to wildfires in France, Spain, and Portugal, where over 600 firefighters have been mobilized. Officials in Germany say Rhine River water levels could reach a critical low any day, making transportation of coal and gasoline increasingly difficult. Our analysis indeed is pointing to extremely low flow affecting almost all the European rivers. At least 30 percent of northern Italy's rice crop has already been lost as the salty Adriatic Sea has creeped nearly 20 miles into the dwindling Po River, a crucial irrigation source. So that's salt up there. The plight is echoed domestically in the California Delta, where decreased snowpack has given way to increased salinity from the Pacific Ocean, leading to a bump in crooked produce unattractive to retail outlets. We just try to hang on and hope the water quality gets better. But I mean, basically, we're paying our bills with 75 percent, if we're lucky, of our income. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Water rights are constant stories in California, but senior and junior allotment holders farther east in Colorado and Nebraska are facing some of those same issues. John Torpy reports in our cover story. At the Colorado Department of Agriculture, we are eyes wide open that we are dealing with a real climate crisis and agriculture is among the first impacted. We've got folks Colorado Commissioner of Agriculture Kate Greenberg is well aware that this climate crisis has impacted farmers in the eastern part of the state. Each year, those farmers play a waiting game to learn how much water will be in their allotment. Mark Arnish is a third-generation eastern Colorado farmer working the land purchased by his grandfather who emigrated from Austria in 1952. The underpinning water supply that we depend upon year over year is from the South Platte River. And imagine not knowing what you could do on your farm because you didn't know what your allocation was for water. The start of that waiting game goes back to 1923, when Colorado and Nebraska ratified a water sharing agreement involving the South Platte River. One section of this interstate compact allows Nebraska to develop a canal in Colorado to divert water from the South Platte River for irrigation on farms in the western part of the Cornhusker state. As the mega drought scorches the high plains in western U.S., water officials in Colorado closely monitor flows on the South Platte River to ensure farmers and ranchers in both Nebraska and Colorado are getting their fair share. Kevin Ryan is the director of the Colorado Division of Water Resources. And the compact recognizes that during the irrigation season, that is, between April 1st and October 15th, we'll measure that flow. And if that flow is above 120 cubic feet per second, then there is really no action to take. But with no end in sight for drought conditions, both states are laying claim to the precious resource that stretches through three states. In this year's legislative session, Nebraska lawmakers passed a bill greenlighting the construction of the Perkins County Canal which is the source of the dispute between the two states. You know, obviously, we're going to be praying for rain here to be able to help us out. But again, just emphasizes the importance of these projects, especially this Perkins County Canal project, that we go forward with this to assure that we'll continue to have the water resources for the future. If we allow Colorado to take our water, that's that much less water we'll have, for example, for Lincoln drinking water. 
There is a hierarchy for water in the two states, with senior water rights, all operations with allotment agreements started before 1897, and junior water rights, all those operators who started after that year. Drought conditions can interfere with the seamless allotment of obligated water as the compact puts a priority on farmers with senior water rights. The flow drops below 120 cubic feet per second, then Colorado needs to curtail water rights on the lower end of the South Platte. If we curtail those water rights, then we are in compliance with the compact during the irrigation season. One season of cutbacks in water allotments can seriously affect a farmer's bottom line. The agreement arranged between Nebraska and Colorado is one of nine interstate compacts the Centennial State has with neighboring states. We're a headwater state. We're responsible for delivering water to many states and the country of Mexico downriver from us. That adds yet another layer to our responsibility uh, as a headwater state and to the challenges that we see uh, with hydrological drought. Officials with the Colorado Department of Water Resources note when drought conditions are low, these water sharing agreements rarely become a long drawn out issue. As D3 and D4 drought conditions continue for Colorado in 2022, farmers continue to worry about how much water will be available for this and future growing seasons. We have a lot of competing interests for our water here in Colorado, not just amongst commodities, but even with the urban-rural divide that we have here. Within agriculture, we try to add value to our water, uh, whether that's um, growing a value-added crop, uh, being a little bit divergent in the marketplace. But here on our farm, we're trying to add value by creating markets. Creating those additional markets can be a struggle when farmers have to fallow fields and still attempt to make the remaining acres cover the loss. When we idle acres, it's like a death by a thousand paper cuts. You know, we're, we're, we still have those overhead costs. We still have taxes to pay. We still have the carry cost of that land for, for that year. And yet we're not going to have a crop until the following year. But it helps us be better managers. It helps us be better planners. And it helps us to think out two and three years instead of just trying to, you know, provide that crop this year. Drought is something that I've had to deal with almost my entire farming career. That, that goes with farming in the high plains of eastern Colorado. We rely upon snow melt. We rely upon a lot of uh, weather from time to time. So in the 25 years that I've been farming, drought seems like it's just right around every corner. Arnish and his family farm around 2,200 acres in what's called Prospect Valley a diverse agricultural area located 45 miles northeast of Denver. Arnish has been forced to change the makeup of his row crop farm nine times to adapt to the changing climate. You know, water touches everything here in eastern Colorado and, and the way our, our rules and regulations have changed over time in Colorado are really impacting my farm. Noting changes in the amount of available water, Arnish has changed his business plan to growing certified seed wheat, certified seed grains for the spirit and beer industry, and value-added feed ingredients. We're trying to be different in the marketplace. I, I wouldn't say niche, I would say value-added, but the things that we do on our farm that are rewarding us and rewarding the value of our water. With the La Nina weather pattern currently calling the shots for the coming spring and summer, Farmers and ranchers in eastern Colorado may have to continue the same kind of flexible approach. And our agricultural community is at the front lines of all of those issues, climate change, persistent ongoing drought, and making sure we are meeting our obligations to other states and the country of Mexico uh, in a way that also helps preserve and advance agriculture. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. Next, the Market to Market Report. Weather stressed the corn crop and market this week before USDA cut the outlook for the harvest on Friday. For the week, the nearby wheat contract added 30 cents, while the September corn contract improved 30 cents as well. The soy complex sold off initially after a raised yield projection, but was not enough to offset weather rallies that happened earlier in the week. 
The nearby contract put on 72 cents. September meal increased 27.20 per ton. December cotton surged 12.46 per hundredweight. That's actually 13 percent. Over in the dairy parlor, September class three milk futures rose 60 cents. The livestock market was mixed. October cattle added 62 cents. September feeders dropped a nickel. And the October lean hog contract put on $1.63. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index shed 91 ticks. September crude oil, that rallied 303. Comex gold expanded by 27.50 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs commodity index rallied by more than 22 points to finish at 677.30. Joining us now to provide some insight on our markets, Naomi Bloom, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Report day. So we'll start with a question from Glenn in Ohio. How about that? Perfect. He takes all my work for me. Glenn wants to know, since we had the Field of Dreams game this week here in Iowa, he wants to know if the report was a pitcher, if it was a pitcher, which pitch did the USDA just throw at us? Was it a fastball, a breaking ball, a changeup? Sounds like it was a get-me-over type pitch to just get us to the next at bat. Yeah, the four seam fastball to just get it over the plate kind of a thing is definitely what the USDA gave us on this report. A lot of the things were expected. A few little pop-ups of, oh, that's a little bit surprising were there, but ultimately no big dramatic changes. So they lowered the planted acres for corn, soybeans, and wheat. And I think for soybeans, we were looking for that increase to happen. So that was a little bit of a surprise. And on corn, they did lower yield, as people were thinking, pretty much in line with pre-report ex pre expectations. So not a big surprise there. And for soybeans, the bigger surprise was that they actually increased the yield just a little bit. So going forward, we're in a situation where, in the bigger picture, yeah, the ending stocks for corn are a little bit tighter than they were last month. And the ending stocks for soybeans are now a little bit bigger than they were last month. And the wheat ending stocks now are a little bit lower than they were last month. So it's enough of a dramatic non-event that the market is going to keep, I think, marching sideways, similar to what it did last year. So going forward, we'll keep watching weather, but this report today did not give us enough new, fresh, bullish news to justify any price breakout higher. And at the same time, if we see prices kind of set back a little bit lower, they should be well supported as we go into fall. Let's start with wheat then more specifically, not as much of a headline for wheat in that report, but we've had headlines this week. Uh, thoughts about being oversold. We've had uh, st some stochastics that were in a certain area, the carry out. What was the biggest driver for you this week? Well, I did like that the USDA lowered the US carry out number. That was a little bit of a surprise. So that just really echoes the fact that our supplies are lower. Um, they did on the report raise wheat exports, and they also said that they're going to be needing more wheat for food demand. So domestically, that number is a little bit stronger. So the wheat market does feel like it's trying to bottom between all three cities. It's trying to bottom, but I don't think it has enough news yet to justify a breakout higher, especially when we're hearing reports that the grain from Ukraine is moving. You know, it's getting exported, and the USDA increased the uh, corn numbers for Ukraine and for Russia. So the global supplies, it's not building, but it's not falling apart either. And given the story we had about the weather in Europe, I mean, that also is playing a factor, but is it more wheat or corn is the story there with European weather? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, the weather has affected their crops in general. I know that right now the price of corn had been higher than the price of wheat, and so we're always thought, well, maybe, you know, is there going to be a need for Europe to be importing any of our products? So that is something to monitor, of course, going forward. Um, but... The bigger picture right now, I think, for this grain market is, again, that this report did not give us any over-the-top bullish news. So it's going to be hard for our U.S. grain prices to go a lot higher from here, especially with wheat. We've got the Russian market cheaper than the U.S. market. And for corn, we've got the Brazilian corn cheaper than U.S. corn right now. So I'm almost wondering if prices need to actually move a little bit lower in the short term? Do we see that seasonal pullback where prices work a little bit lower into the end of August? And I know that folks are thinking, you know, hey, this crop is still burning up and it's not made out there yet. But remember, folks, the USDA isn't going to give us those friendly bullish numbers that we're all hoping for until the January report. 
And so the boots in the ground for surveys are going to be, of course, watched as we have those um, surveys happening. But we're not going to get those bullish numbers. Not yet. Not yet. We're getting not bullish weather reports uh, specifically on that uh, soybean. Con oh, I guess you could say in the soybean we are. Hot and dry is what you expect with soybeans. Uh, but we're pretty hot and dry. Yeah, so we're hot and dry with the beans market and then with the yield there, but there's also chances of rain next week. And so if those materialize, it again just kicks the can down the road because you never know with beans what's really out there until you're actually harvesting. But I think that's the USDA's way of saying, you know, it's, it's not a emergency issue for right now and the world is going to be able to get by. And so... I, let me just be blunt. If people are waiting for seven or eight dollar corn or dramatically higher prices, we're in a point right now of reset or pause. And all of those stars that aligned so perfectly last year to give us eight dollar corn, they're behind us. So now going forward, we're at the pause here and markets probably trade sideways until we can get to know some more information on demand, on yield. So for prices to go higher from here, from all these people who are barking about why prices should go up, let me tell you, you're going to need a lower U.S. dollar. You need confirmation that this corn crop is below 170 bushels. You would need confirmation that the soybean crop would be lower than probably 45 bushels. And you're going to need to see demand pick up. You, you know, have to have an early frost and then compromised by a, all of a sudden wet late harvest. So I guess what I'm trying to say for the stars to align from here to get those higher prices, it's probably not going to happen in the short term. OK, December corn. Let's I'm not going to put you on the spot for September, but December we're still at 642 is what we closed at today. Uh, give me a quick range yep. for the next three months on that. Yeah, 650 is going to be a big resistance on that market. Six dollars is good support. Step back, though, and look, even though our carryout is lower from last month on corn, it still is 150 million bushels higher than it was last year at this time. Last year at this time, the price of December corn was 575. OK, so we have more corn carryout and the USDA increased old crop carryout. So I know people are not wanting to hear this, but I'm telling you, I don't think fundamentally at this moment we have a reason for December corn to get higher than 650. And it'll be a struggle for the November soybeans to get higher than 1450. We would need, you know, again, you know, bad weather to happen or some big export news to come out to get prices to go higher. And 1450, that's really what we're at with November yeah. right now, 1454 today. Uh, quickly on dairy, uh, we've seen some resurgence in that crop. Right. So uh, the dairy Sorry. market, so we had our summer highs of 24. We pulled back to 20 and now we're hanging out there. So what happened, we had um, the cheese prices come down. The block barrel average is hanging out right now near 180. Uh, so that's actually a really good support level for the block barrel average. Our exports are still great. They're really doing well. But on the most recent dairy production report, milk production was up 0.2%. And that was the first time we saw a year over year increase. So that weighed on things a little bit, but like all commodities, everything is just sitting on these long-term uptrend lines and we're waiting for some more news. And uh, that's just where we're at right now. Well, live cattle has done that too. They're the highest in three months right now. Yeah, that market, of course, still supported by the idea of the fact that production is going to be down fourth quarter, down, I think, 5% from a year ago. First quarter production is supposed to be down 7% from a year ago and going into second quarter of next year, production down almost 10% from year ago levels. So we know that it's a friendly story there. I would caution though with cattle and even with hogs, they've gone up so much and they are where they're supposed to be priced, but it wouldn't surprise me if we see a little bit of a correction or some profit taking, but overall it still is a friendly story unless we see de demand falter. But right now our exports for beef are just phenomenal, the best they've ever been. And as long as Americans are not getting laid off and they're still working, I think you're still going to see the demand there. Well, and I had a hog note here. Uh, you know, Mexico has been buying, China has been buying some things. Is that what's propping up? Hog market? Um, a little bit of that. Our exports have been okay. They're behind where they were last year and the year before that. But the pork cutout values have been really strong. The cash market's been strong. And we've had really good demand overall this summer. So we're getting into that time frame with um, heading into Labor Day that prices probably see a little bit of a pullback here. But what's interesting is that our um, hog numbers, you know, they're down a little bit from year ago levels. And actually, our weights are the lowest that they've been since 2017. So our production isn't going to be as triumphant going forward. We're still going to be scaled back a little bit, so that should keep the market supported. 
losing weight there in the hog market, huh? <laughs> yes, is that what's going on? I mean, is that a, is that a little offset of uh, the, the feed issue? Yeah, that's exactly what's going on. The higher price feed is there. And I think producers are just, they're very smart knowing that that herd in China had been rebuilding. So they did a great job of controlling their inventory. And kudos to them. They've done a fantastic job. You're going to be a hit in the hog barn this year at the Iowa State <laughs> Fair with comments like that, Naomi Bloom. Thank you so very much for your time. You. Appreciate it. All right, we are going to put a pause on this analysis here, and we're going to continue with Naomi and answer more of your submitted questions in our Market Plus segment. You can find that on our website of markettomarket.org, and that is in both podcast and also on YouTube. And all of these resources, as a reminder, are free. We've also isolated the market analysis, which you just heard, the Market Plus, which we're about to record and wasn't on TV, and the MTOM. These are all three different podcast offerings that we have for you each and every week. And next week, we're going to look at the partnership, shoring up and shortening up the grain chain. Thank you for watching. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Sukup Manufacturing Company, providing equipment and buildings to store and condition grain to help farmers adjust to market swings. We build drying, moving, and storage equipment designed to preserve the quality of their crops. Sukup Manufacturing. Store now, profit later. Tomorrow. For over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.